Have you ever heard of John List? In 1971, he killed his family and laid the bodies out in the ballroom of their Westfield, New Jersey mansion. The next day, he turned on all of the lights in the house and drove off. No one discovered the crime for over a month. John List went missing and was on the FBI's most wanted list for nearly 18 years before getting caught. Why did he kill his family in their beautiful home? What happened to the place after the gruesome discovery? Welcome to Nightmare Houses. The original owner of the estate at 431 Hillside Avenue in Westfield, New Jersey was John Samuel Augustus Whitkey and his family. Whitkey was a German immigrant who arrived in the United States in 1865 at just 18 years old and settled in Westfield in the 1870s. A wealthy manufacturer of business and accounting firms, he lived on Broad Street before purchasing a 22-acre property on Hillside Avenue in 1895. The parcel resided on the highest hill in town, almost a mile northwest of Westfield Center, straddling the town line with Mountainside, New Jersey. The property was initially set approximately 100 feet back on a gentle knoll and was one of the most attractive homes in town. A 19-room Georgian-style mansion, complete with a music and art room, known as the ballroom, once housed a handsome collection of paintings. Named Breeze Knoll for the gentle breezes atop the hillside, it was the family home of one of Westfield's most prominent community members for nearly 70 years. Breeze Knoll was a classic colonial revival architecture style with heavy elements of Georgian features and was inspired by a sea captain's home in Salem, Massachusetts. Built around 1896, the exact built dates are not known, it was an elegant, three-story dwelling. There was a large, well-landscaped yard as Mr. Wickey enjoyed gardening. The most identifiable Georgian features are the classic Palladian center window on the second story, the front porch emphasizing the central entryway, the visual symmetry, and the heavy dark green shutters against a white exterior. There was oak flooring throughout the home. There were 10 fireplaces, some made of marble and others from hand-carved teak. There were five baths total, and the first floor had two living rooms, a dining room, a large kitchen with a butler's pantry, and a laundry room. A large ballroom measuring 33 feet long and 23 feet wide, located at the back of the house, had a light green tinted stained glass skylight and was built as an extension in 1905 and housed the prized art and book collections. Underneath the ballroom was a billiard room. The long hall on the second floor had five bedrooms, while on the third floor were the servants' quarters containing two bedrooms, a living room, and a kitchen. The stairway leading to the second floor was an imperial staircase splitting in two at the top. Wiki was married to Phoebe Cooper, and they had four children, Henrietta, Wellington, Charles, and Gertrude. The first wedding that occurred at Breeze Knoll was on October 10, 1906, the marriage of Whitkey's youngest daughter, Gertrude, to George Harold Whitney. The event took place in the ballroom at 6.30 p.m., and the room was decorated with potted plants, white lilies, chrysanthemums, pink roses, and smilax. The Whitney family also lived on Hillside Avenue in a neighboring property at 319, and that estate was built in 1890. Gertrude would live in that house, which is still standing today. Tragically, her husband George died there on March 9, 1929, at age 46. The next Whitkey wedding was on November 24, 1932. The marriage of Gertrude and George Whitney's daughter, Jean Whitney, to Carl Wood on Thanksgiving in 1932. Her grandfather, John Whitkey, gave her away. Everything was just like her mother's wedding. Jean even wore the same wedding gown as her mother back in 1906. The marriage for Jean and Carl did not last long, 
and they ultimately divorced in 1936. The first known occurrence of the police being called to Breeze Knoll happened on July 25, 1908, when a severe domestic disturbance was reported. In the morning, domestic employee Molly Brown allegedly attacked her employer, Mrs. Phoebe Whitkey, with a heavy piece of kindling wood. It appears that Miss Brown, in a violent rage, struck Mrs. Whitkey over the head repeatedly, giving her four gashes to the head and breaking one of her fingers in the process. Groundskeepers and next-door neighbors heard Mrs. Whitkey's screams for help and quickly rescued her from the attack. Mrs. Whitkey had been alone in the house, with the employee when the incident occurred. The Westfield police were dispatched to the residence and took Miss Brown to police headquarters. Authorities charged Miss Brown with atrocious assault for nearly murdering her employer and was later deemed insane by a local doctor. She was sent to nearby Morris Plains, New Jersey, home of Greystone Park Psychiatric Hospital. Before the attack occurred, Miss Brown appears to have worked for the Whitkey family for nearly a decade possibly longer. Her fate after the incident is unknown, and it is unclear why she attacked Mrs. Whitkey. Phoebe Whitkey died at Breeze Knoll in January 1929. She was 87 years old and died after a brief illness, likely in her bedroom. Her funeral was held at the estate shortly after. On May 27, 1936, Patriarch John Samuel Augustus Whitkey died in his house. In an ironic twist of fate, he died after falling down the grand staircase and fracturing his skull. He never regained consciousness and died approximately two hours later, likely downstairs. Mr. Whitkey was 88 years old at the time. Henrietta was the oldest child of John and Phoebe Whitkey. She had been married in 1903, but was divorced by 1914. At that time, Henrietta moved back into Bree's Knoll. She continued to live and host community events there until shortly before her death and died in neighboring Mountainside, New Jersey on June 27, 1962, just two days before her 88th birthday. She never remarried or had any children, but was actively involved with the community in Westfield most of her life. In 1938, John Mills Whitkey, a grandson of John Whitkey and son of Wellington Whitkey, moved into Breeze Knoll with his wife Dorothy, living there with his aunt Henrietta. John Mills Whitkey established a small business and worked from home well into the 1950s. Sometime in the late 1950s or early 1960s, Whitkey appears to have purchased neighboring 437 Hillside Avenue, but continued to own 431 Hillside Avenue until 1965. He would live there with his family at 437 Hillside and later on at Breeznell Drive, which was established sometime in the 1950s and was located behind the original property. In 1955, Jean Whitney, who celebrated her first marriage at Breeznell over two decades earlier, moved back into Breeznell following a scandalous engagement. It is not clear how long Jean lived at Breeze Knoll, and she seemingly lived a quiet life following the incident in 1955. She died in Worcester, Massachusetts in September 1993 and did not appear to have any children. They were the last of the Whitkey family to live at Breeze Knoll. In 1965, the grandchildren of John Whitkey sold the property to a family that was new to town. In July 1965, John Emil List and his wife Helen purchased the 19-room sprawling mansion on Hillside Avenue. After working at Xerox in Rochester, New York, John accepted a prestigious job at a Jersey City bank. Breeze Knoll, elegant, set back and landscaped, was Helen's dream home. They moved into the house with their three children, Patricia, John Jr., and Frederick, as well as John's elderly mother, Alma. It was not the family's first move for John's career. Before settling in Westfield, the family resided in California, Detroit, and Rochester. John had previously worked for prestigious and growing companies earlier in his career, but seemed to lack the skills necessary for promotion. So he looked elsewhere, always seeking a well-paid position and important sounding title to please his wife. Alma, John's elderly mother, moved with the family primarily for financial reasons. John was unable to afford the house without her. 
Helen Morris Taylor married Marvin Everett Taylor in 1941 when she was just 16 years old. The couple had two children, Brenda and Kenneth Everett Taylor. Kenneth died at two months old while Brenda lived with Helen until adulthood. On April 16, 1951, Marvin was killed in action in North Korea. He was 33 years old and was awarded the Bronze Star, the Purple Heart, the Combat Infantryman's Badge, the Korean Service Medal, the United Nations Service Medal, the National Defense Service Medal, the Korean War Presidential Unit Citation, and the Republic of Korea War Service Medal. Marvin's body did not return to the United States until October. Helen buried her late husband on October 12, 1951, and just one day later, she met John List at a bowling alley in Newport News, Virginia, while she was out with her younger sister, Jean. John had joined the military in the 1940s and was recalled in 1950 during the escalation of the Korean War. He was well-educated, and he had an MBA. He thought Helen was gorgeous with her tall and slender figure. However, Helen appeared to have a lazy eye, which was caused by an accident where ether splashed in her eye during the birth of her first child. Helen was self-conscious about it, as she took pride in her appearance and was always well-dressed and stylish. John and Helen married just three months after meeting. It was his first marriage. Helen had insisted the couple wed in Baltimore, Maryland. Unbeknownst to John, Helen had contracted syphilis from her first husband when he was in Korea. Maryland did not require a blood test for a marriage license at that time, and thus, Helen was able to keep her secret. John was largely inexperienced with women and grew up a devout Lutheran. Helen was desperate to find a suitable new husband for her and her daughter, Brenda. John and Helen would have three children of their own, Patricia, John Jr., and Frederick. By the time the family had moved to Westfield in 1965, Helen's battle with syphilis had worsened, and she was suffering from cerebral atrophy. She drank scotch heavily every day and depended on several prescribed pills, such as tranquilizers. She stayed in bed most of the time, often battling debilitating headaches. The marriage between John and Helen had ultimately proved disappointing for both. Helen had lost interest in church, something fundamental to John and his lifetime of devoutness. Helen berated John, often comparing him to her first husband, who died a war hero. The relationship was undoubtedly strained. However, Helen and John had fallen in love with Breeze Knoll. It needed work, but they had hopes of restoring the beautiful home to its former glory. They also saw it as an opportunity to rekindle their marriage. The reality was that the new position John List had accepted didn't last long. He found himself unable to hold down a job afterward, especially a well-paying job like the one at the Jersey City Bank, which initially drew the family to Westfield. He was never able to hold down another suitable position again. By the early 1970s, John List found himself working in insurance out of the house, largely unsuccessfully, and struggling to make any payments. By the summer of 1971, List had sold most of the furniture in the home. In addition, he was driving a 1963 Chevrolet that he could not afford to have inspected, and the funds that he had been stealing from his mother were almost out. He was also tricking his family into thinking he would work, but in reality, he would take the train from Westfield a few stops over and sit and read a newspaper until the end of the working day. In addition, John may have felt that he lacked control of his career and marriage, but that he may also have thought he was losing control of his children. In particular, his daughter Patricia was 16 and recently became interested in acting. On the morning of Tuesday, November 9th, 1971, John List waited for his children to leave for school. He then remained in the study and waited for his wife Helen to stir. She woke up, went downstairs, and made her morning coffee before he snuck up on her while she was seated at the kitchen table. She turned her head just in time to see her killer. He shot her once in the head. The bullet appears to have gone through her and into the lower kitchen cabinets. After she was dead, John dragged her body into the nearby ballroom across the hall. Helen was 46 years old. Next, John went to the third floor attic apartment where his 84-year-old mother, Alma, lived. 
She heard the gunshot and grew concerned at the sound. He shot his mother in the kitchen while she was making breakfast. He shot her in the head above the eye. She was looking right at him. List had attempted to move the body, but ultimately left her in the third floor hallway in a closet area. He later indicated she was too heavy to carry. List then spent the rest of the morning running errands, sending letters to the children's school to let them know they would be out of town visiting family in North Carolina and canceling mail and deliveries. Finally, he proceeded to empty his and his mother's bank accounts before returning home and eating lunch. His 16-year-old daughter, Patricia, came home early from school that day because she wasn't feeling well. Patricia and her brother, Frederick, both had an after-school job at an insurance office, but Patricia had called out sick. When she came home and approached the back entrance, a small doorway near the kitchen, she was shot once in the head by her father. Patricia was the only family member who didn't see her killer. She was still wearing her leather coat when he dragged her into the ballroom and laid her on a sleeping bag perpendicular to her mother's body. Next, his 13-year-old son, Frederick, had called the after-school job asking what happened to Pat, unsure why she didn't show up to work that afternoon. When Frederick came home, he was shot in the head and dragged into the ballroom and laid next to his sister. John Jr., 15, had a soccer game that afternoon. List went down to the school to watch John Jr. play while the rest of the family was dead at home. When they got back to the mansion, he shot John Jr. multiple times. John Jr. was the only family member who tried to fight or escape his killer, something John List was not expecting. He shot him repeatedly. John Jr. was still wearing his gloves from outside when he died. The body was dragged into the ballroom and placed next to his little brother's body. They were placed just inside the doorway, on the right-hand side, near the grand fireplace in the ballroom. John List cleaned up most of the mess with paper towels following the murders. That night, he made dinner and went into his office. He wrote a multi-page confession to his pastor on a yellow-lined notepad. He left it in a filing cabinet and the 9mm Steyr handgun and 22 caliber revolver he used to murder his family. It appeared John List had organized his affairs enough to give him time to evade the police. The letter he wrote on 11-9-1971. Dear Pastor Renwinkel, I'm very sorry to add this additional burden to your work. I know what has been done is wrong from all that I have been taught, and that any reason I might give will not make it right. But you are the only person that I know that, while not condoning this, will at least possibly understand why I felt I had to do this. 1. I wasn't earning anywhere near enough to support us. Everything I tried seemed to fall to pieces. True, we could have gone bankrupt and maybe gone on welfare. 2. But that brings me to my next point. Knowing the type of location that one would have to live in, plus the environment for the children, plus the effect of them knowing that they were on welfare was just more than I thought that they could and should endure. I know that they were willing to cut back, but this involved a lot more than that. Three, with Pat being so determined to get into acting, I was fearful as to what that might do to her continuing to be a Christian. I'm sure it wouldn't have helped. 4. Also, with Helen not going to church, I knew that this would harm the children eventually in their attendance. I had continued to hope that she would begin to come to church soon, but when I mentioned to her that Mr. Yutz said he wanted to pay her an elder's call, she just blew up and said she wanted to take her name off church rolls. Again, this could only have had an adverse result for the children's continued attendance. So that is the sum of it. If any one of these had been the condition, we might have pulled through, but this was just too much. At least I'm certain that they have all gone to heaven now. If things had gone on, who knows if this would be the case. Of course mother got involved because doing what I did to my family would have been tremendous shock to her at this age. Therefore, knowing that she is also a Christian, I felt it best that she be relieved of the troubles of this world that would have hit her. After it was all over, I said some prayers for them, all from the hymn book. That was the least I could do. Now for the final arrangements. Helen and the children have all agreed they would prefer to be cremated. Please see to it that the costs are kept low. 
For Mother, She Has a Plot at the Frankenmuth Church Cemetery, please contact Mr. Herman Shakilis, Route 4, Vassar, Michigan. He's married to a niece of Mother's and knows what arrangements are to be made. She always wanted Reverend Herman Zender of Bay City to preach the sermon, but he's not well. Also, I'm leaving some letters in your care. Please send them on and add whatever comments you think appropriate. The relationships are as follows. Mrs. Lydia Meyer, mother's sister. Mrs. Eva Meyer, Helen's mother. Jean Seifert, Helen's sister. Also, I don't know what will happen to the books and personal things, but to the extent possible, I'd like for them to be distributed as you see fit. Some books might go to the school or church library. Originally, I had planned this for November 1st, All Saints Day, but travel arrangements were delayed. I thought it would be an appropriate day for them to get to heaven. As for me, please let me be dropped from the congregation rolls. I leave myself in the hands of God's justice and mercy. I don't doubt that he is able to help us, but apparently he saw fit not to answer my prayers in the way that I had hoped they would be answered. This made me think that perhaps it was not for the best as far as the children's souls are concerned. I know that many will only look at the additional years that they could have lived, but if finally they were no longer Christians, what would be gained? I am also sure many would say, how could anyone do such a horrible thing? My only answer is that it isn't easy and was only done after much thought. Pastor, Mrs. Norris may possibly be reached at 802 Pleasant Hill Drive, Elkin, home of her sister. One other thing, it may seem cowardly to have always shot from behind, but I didn't want any of them to know, even at the last second, that I had to do this to them. John got hurt more because he seemed to struggle longer. The rest were immediately out of pain. John didn't consciously feel anything either. Please remember me in your prayers. I will need them whether or not the government does its duty as it sees it. I'm only concerned with making my peace with God, and of this I am assured because of Christ dying even for me. P.S. Mother is in the hallway in the attic, third floor. She was too heavy to move. John. John Liss slept in Breeze Knoll that night, the corpses of his family in the house with him. The following day, he woke up, turned on all of the lights, the temperature down, and turned on the built-in sound system. He left the radio playing on a religious station, which eerily played throughout the house until the day of the discovery. The last event held at Breeze Knoll was a big Halloween party Patricia hosted shortly before her murder. She likely invited her high school and theater friends on Saturday, October 30th, 1971. The nearly empty ballroom still had Pat's Halloween party remnants, which were forever captured in photos. The lights left on at Breeze Knoll started to burn out and neighbors became concerned. The family hadn't been heard from in nearly a month, 29 days to be exact, before the community learned what had happened. Ultimately, Patricia List's theater instructor, Edwin Iliano, discovered the gruesome scene on December 7, 1971, and called the police. Patricia was close to her theater instructor and had joined the local acting group earlier that year. Her instructor hadn't heard from her and was concerned. List had a growing concern about his daughter joining the theater and with her relationship with Iliano. John List had ample time to plan the murders, get away, and disappear. In his mind, he did the right thing. He put his family out of the real and imagined misery. At the time of the murders, John List had three mortgages on 431 Hillside Avenue, two at the First Federal Savings and Loan Association and another at Suburban Trust Company of Westfield. He was deep underwater on Breeze Knoll in 1971. When he left, the state of the residence was poor. The mansion was in disrepair. Rumors dating back to 1972 claim the ballroom had a stained glass ceiling designed by Louis C. Tiffany. If true, would have saved the family from financial ruin at an estimated value of $100,000. However, there is no evidence that the ballroom was a Tiffany original, nor is there any indication that he would have been relieved of a dire financial situation if he had sold the home. John List avoided capture for nearly 18 years. He was finally caught after being featured on America's Most Wanted in 1989 and was quickly recognized. His assumed name was now Robert Clark, after a man he knew from school, and he had remarried. 
he was having financial problems with his new wife. The John List I knew was a very nice man, and uh, probably the last person you would have thought would have done something like this. It was a crime that shocked not only the small town of Westfield, New Jersey, but the entire nation. Something like that had never happened to him before. That kind of mass murders. I mean, uh, single murders are rare. No matter whole family wiped out. On November 9th, 1971, John List shot and killed his mother, wife, and three children. The grisly discovery was made a month later. Four of the bodies lying in the ballroom of the 19-room mansion. Officer Charlie Haller was the first police officer on the scene. He cleaned up a lot of the blood and had bags with uh, bloody towels and rags. That's uh, one thing you never forget, something like that you never think would happen or you'd come upon. And it stuck with me for a long time. List left New Jersey the next morning, changed his name to Robert Clark, and spent the next 17 and a half years on the lam. But in 1989, the TV show America's Most Wanted profiled the case, and a caller from Denver blew List's cover. Among those shocked, his second wife. I have never known Robert to be anything but a sweet and gentle man, a good character. At the trial, prosecutors showed the 9mm gun List used to kill his family, and a five-page confession letter left the night of the murders. In it, List talked about financial troubles and how the family was straying from the church. List, who was devoutly religious, said he killed them to save their souls from hell. The individual's capacity is just so large, and if you push to a point, there's always a point of breaking. And I think John was pushed to this capacity. But the jury found no mercy for List and convicted him of five counts of first-degree murder. At his sentencing, List apologized. That I remain truly <coughs> sorry for the tragedy that happened in 1971. I feel that due to my mental state at the time, I was unaccountable for what happened. John List was eventually tried and convicted of his crimes and died in prison in 2008. The house sat vacant following the tragic discovery of the bodies the previous December. Vandals and curiosity seekers broke into the home like Ed Eliano and the police did through the basement window below the ballroom. On August 30th, 1972, precisely nine months after the brutal murders of the List family, Breeze Knoll burned down in a mysterious fire. At approximately 3.17 a.m., the first alarm went out to the Hillside Avenue mansion for the last time. The blaze started in the open center hall, flames spreading quickly. It's not too far-fetched to imagine local teenagers, perhaps ones who knew some or all of the list children, breaking into the house and starting the fire. It was an era of the occult, an interest in witchcraft and other dark magic was common in teens during the 60s and the 70s. Considering the time of the event, 3 a.m., a.k.a. the witching hour, it could have very well been some drunk teens with candles fooling around trying to summon the victims. However, Breeze Knoll was the sixth victim of John List's crime, reportedly costing over $43,000 in damages in 1972. After the fire, the plot sat vacant until it sold at a sheriff's auction for $36,000 in December 1972. In 1974, a new house was built in its place, set about 50 feet back further from the original property, but still strangely reminiscent of Breeze Knoll. This house is a brick Georgian-style mansion and can barely be visible from the street. The address is still 431 Hillside Avenue. Wiki built up wealth and an estate, leaving it to his family to symbolize the hard work and legacy he intended to leave behind. Breeze Knoll served one prominent Westfield family for three generations before being sold off. John List, an outsider, murdered his family and destroyed Breeze Knoll in just six years. John List was chasing an American dream and trying to keep up with a lifestyle he couldn't afford. A profoundly religious man, List found himself backed into several tight corners regarding his finances, his family, and his faith. It was a clash of generations, expectations, disappointments, and unlivable pressure. Ultimately, his struggle to be successful in life caught up with him in the most violent way imaginable quintuple homicide. Then he chose to be a coward. He ran away. He was leaving Breeze Knoll and his murdered family behind. 
List was backed into many corners, and he felt he had no other way out in his mind. It's been over 50 years since the murders. Both John and Helen were dishonest. Helen about her health condition, and John about his financial and job situations. But it was all John List who chose to do what he did that fateful day. He killed his family, gave himself a fresh start, and left them to be ghosts, forever trapped in the early winter of 1971 in a house that no longer exists, in a town they will never fully integrated with that would probably like to forget. He couldn't afford to live there. Had it not been for John List, Bree's Knoll may still be standing and remembered as the Wiki Estate, but will always be forever known as the List House, stuck in time and place. Thank you for listening to Nightmare Houses. For more information, including photos and references, please visit www.nightmarehouses.com. Until next time, goodbye.